Hi, I'm Ali from Practical Boat Owner Magazine and I'm here with Daryl Morgan, Technical Manager of um, Bainbridge International. Daryl actually came down to the PBO project boat last week to measure up for some new sails and this is the next stage in the process. So, um, yeah, so we're going to take the measurements that we took from the on board the boat last week and we're going to input them into the sail design program and from there we're going to create a set of sails for Ali's new PBO Maxi 84 Maximus. So once you've got that information in place, it makes life a lot easier as a sailmaker to design um, the sails around the, um, the rig. So we took your P&E dimensions and inputted them up and basically built this sail for PBO. P is the mast dimension and E is the boom dimension. Okay. Um, it's the maximum dimension between the black bands. We've just done nice standard mainsail, mm -hmm. two sets of reefs with four standard bands because I think we discussed that we didn't want to go fully bad. What would, have, um, <clears throat> what would you have done previously before the, the software? Is it just a load of measurements and a load of drawings? Trusty scale ruler, mm -hmm. pencil, a calculator, and a, um, a set of um, drawing boards, tools, uh, protractor, scale ruler, and, and those sort of items and, and literally um, sat at a drawing board and um, started penciling it out to a scale. So I always used to use one to 50 and um, yeah, and just take your measurements and scale them down, draw it out on pencil and paper and, and, uh, and away you go. The downside to that is it's only a two dimensional yeah. aspect of the cells. Um, so it's, it's a flat, flat cell. Whereas with the more advanced software like this, you can actually describe the three dimensional shape yeah. of the cell, which will take up its aerofoil, its set shape, and then input that into the designs and you can actually see how the clue moves around and where it's gonna sheet. And it, 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 it's way more um, accurate. So to create the rig and stuff, to be honest, pencil and paper, super fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> super fast, especially when you're as old as me. Um, and some of the young kids with their design cats and stuff are significantly quicker than that on old school. Um, but to actually cut the cell and design the cell shape, a uh, computer wins out every time. And we, you know, if it's, um, oh no, I don't really want to say that. But, but if it's a nice standard mold and there's nothing flash about it, you can do it in 15 minutes. Yeah. Which, you know, in the old days when you chalked them out on the loft floor, it would have taken you 15 minutes just to draw the sail out because you used to do it one to one. Yeah. So if it was 30 foot by 10 foot, you needed 30 foot by 10 foot of floor space and, and oh, wow. drew it out on a piece yeah. of chalk mm -hmm. and then you laid the panels out and cut the board seam and then gave them to one of the uh, machinists to put together for you. Yeah. Nowadays, it's all done on a little A4 screen yeah. and uh, away you go. Mm. A lot of cells now are fully battened cells and that's where the batten extends from the leech to the luff of the cell, so either across the whole width of the cell. Um, this increases longevity on the cell um, because it helps prevent flutter um, and just general abuse of the cell, so it will help with that. The downside to it is, is um, hoisting and lowering the cell, so you're going to need some um, pressure cars on the luff because of the increased friction from the full length battens. So the full length battens, they don't work, they actually work on compression. So this is the mast. The batten itself is actually pushing into the mast. So as you're trying to hoist and lower, you're, you're, you're pushing against the battens. So you need something to release the compression and um, reduce friction so that you can hoist the cell. Hoisting the cell is always relatively easy it's more about lowering the cell because yeah. you need the safety of being able to reef the cell or drop the cell in an emergency but um, that's the downside and a little bit extra additional cost for the hardware and um, the longer battens but to be honest to be frank most these days yeah there's, it's like everything the costs have gone down and um, it's, it's a viable option so obviously being at Bainbridge we make our own range of um, sailman batten cars um, they've been in the industry for 30 odd years, um, they're a proven design and um, yeah they just they, they work and it's a known, they're a known known, you don't have to guess work and they won't fail, um, they'll just be reliable for the lifetime of the cell because you would expect a Dacron cell to last 
10 plus years. Uh, so if, if you were single-handed or, or sort of you you were going to be lowering that sail by yourself, you didn't have any help, then you think a, a fully batting yeah. would be a good option. Okay. Yeah, yeah. so single-handed guys and stuff like that. So if you go fully battened um, with a set of lazy jacks and in some sort of stack pack arrangement or um, when, the, when the sail drops, it's guided down the lazy jacks straight into the boom bag, out of the way. You zip it up, put it in bed. It's 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 very good. It's very easy, and the battens do control the sail when yeah. it's coming down. It's not going to fall off the boom and flop all over the place. It's just really nice, easy, yeah. simple, and and a good seaman like way of doing okay. the job. It's safe as well. Yeah. So yeah, for sure, definitely do that. A lot of sales are hybrid sales now, so mm -hmm. like a one plus three or a two plus two. So that would be the top two battens would be full length, and then the lower two battens would be uh, forty percent of the width of the sail, give or take. Um, reason for that is it helps reduce the cost because you only have two batten cars, and the sail low down is less likely to flog, um, and it's easier for the reefs and points. That's your main there, yeah. okay? And um, we can put the rig on it here. So we need to get that there. So now you can see that it it, it, it hits inside. Yeah. That black band there is your E-dimension. Comes out, and we've got the offset here for the slides. So this is how accurate we can be. Yeah. And then you're the rig, and you can see how it sits on the mast and the boom and stuff like that. That's the sail. So that's the main, the boom, and, the, and, and, and that's with the head still attached. And we can actually design this out. So you remember your, your fur that was 400, and 400 millimeters up, 450 mil up from yeah. memory. So we can actually locate the tack, yeah. the correct height, so that the clue height's correct, so that the sail sheets correctly onto the track. Um, and you can see that there. But also um, we can look right into it and you can see the interaction and you can check that your design doesn't impact the rig so that when it's fully sheeted in correctly upwind, it doesn't um, crash into the spreaders. Yeah. All right. Which, which in the old days, in a pencil and paper, you, you couldn't do that. Yeah. I mean, you, you couldn't do that. You were working with flat triangles. Um, but now we're working with, you know, um, foil shapes. So we can, I can get right in there. And... Um, with the modern design, you can actually describe the rig really well. So um, I could describe the rod size, the size of the wire, the size of the shrouds, the spreaders and everything and get, get zoom in really, really accurate. So if you're doing a really big one off racing project or something and you wanted to get it bang on, you would definitely do that. Um, and we've gone as accurate as we need to be for your Maxi 84, okay? The actual two die, 2D dimensions of the sail are chosen to um, fit within the parameters of the rig. Um, and the clue location is described in this one as 130% of the J measurement because that's a really nice all round size for a roller furling head saw. Um, roller furling Genoa has to do the whole gamut of the range of wind and sea conditions that you can expect. So you want it to be able to um, help the boat sail in five knots, but also in 25 knots. Um, and that's, that's a lot of range for one sail. So What's the J measurement? The J measurement is the foredeck. So the J measurement is the, from the stem head fitting of the tack to the front face of the mast along the foredeck. That's the J dimension. And then 130% is basically J times 1.3. And that's how we get the clue location. So, so previously um, with hank on sales, which nobody uses anymore, very rarely fuses, you would have had 150% number one, then you would have had 140 number two. Um, God, you might have had, yeah. And then some sort of weird number three, don't worry about that talking to that and then a working gibbet like 85 percent and those three or maybe a combination of three or four cells it would have been used to um for you to be a, for you to enable you to sail in any condition 
Yeah. However, when you wanted to change the sail, if the conditions changed while you're out sailing, you would have had to drop a sail, climb onto the fore deck, back the sail up, take another sail up, hank it back on, hoist it all up, and all this while in, while the conditions are getting worse, or it's raining, or it's dark, or or the beast from the east comes in and it's snowing on you. Um, and just to uh, to spell it out, the yeah. the lighter the wind, the higher the percentage yes so the lighter the wind um the larger the overlap which is um 150 so it's the j dimension times 1.5 as the wind increases obviously well not obviously as the wind increases you need to reduce sail area so by reducing the lp um, which is the luff perpendicular which is a percentage of the j dimension might be too much Anyway, damage. So you make smaller and smaller sails because um, as the wind gets up, you don't need so much sail area to drive the boat forward. I mean, it will, it will reach um, hull speed very quickly and you'll be fine. Um, so if you had your number one up in 15 knots, as an example for the average boat, not a Contessa 32, um, for your average boat, you'd be excessively healed, you'd be struggling to um, go upwind well, uh, it would be uncomfortable and you'd want a smaller headsail. So you would put your number two on, which could be a 130% so of it's a 20% smaller sail. So you've reduced your sail area, the boat will sail more upright, it'll be more comfortable, it'll point better, it'll be more manageable. Mm -hmm. Okay, so nowadays, um, roller furling Genoa has to do everything. But because it has to do everything, you have to kind of um, optimize its maximum sail area. So 130, 135% is the biggest because it will give you enough sail area so that you get some light air performance. But as the wind strength increases or the sea breeze kicks in, in the afternoon and you want a smaller sail up, you can, you can sail with the smaller sail before you have to fill it up. And then when it increases into um, a five, force five, 16, 18, 20 knots, and you do need to reduce sail area, you can roll it up and you have a nice effective sail shape and a better sized sail for worse conditions, which is generally why a roller phone you know, is not the biggest it could be, it's kind of uh, an intermediate sail because it has to do a bit of everything. It has to work well in um, five knots, but also work well in 25 knots and the more you furl them up and reef them up, the less efficient they get. So you're trying to find that nice midpoint. Oh, wow, that was really interesting. Yeah, because I was sort of reading forums just yesterday about do you need well, a... don't read forums. <laughs> do you need they, a they storm do. jib or, you know, or, or a furl engineer at its very smallest? Um, I suppose you still want to... Whoa. Again, so that's so much of the type of sailing you're doing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, going offshore or any extended passages or anything along that line then, then I would say yes you need a storm jib um, however these days I mean how do you deploy the storm jib yeah a bit of it. awkward so you can get one of these sock jibs where you roll the jib up and you put the storm jib on a, um, a soft luff and you pull it up over the top of the furled headsail and that gives you a small on yours, it'll be about a six square meter cell, which is what, real language, 65 square feet? Yeah. No, no, let's stay metric. Stay metric, <laughs> no square feet. Um, yeah. So that, that, but it's again, it's a bit of a compromise. Or the other one is to put a, an inner stay and hoist it up on an inner stay, or the best one is to um, take the head saw down and put it up but again you that's that's the real complications of that so but um you know there are certain requirements if you if you if you race in the um the 600 mile races or anything like that you know yeah. the racing rules regulations say you will take a storm jib um if you were going to go passage making um i would definitely carry a storm jib yeah if you're just coastal where you know you're doing 10 15 20 mile hops between ports you're not going to use it. Yeah. So you know? into port long before you get to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're not going to use it. Yeah. Um, if you're just going to use use it for, we're going to take a week off and we're going to hop down the coast and then nip across to the Sillies and have a lovely weekend 
and then sail back over 10, 15 days from the south coast. Again, you probably wouldn't want to use it because you'd be picking your weather windows. Yeah. Um, so yeah, storm jibs. <laughs> and then and it's, like, like, it's like having, you know, do you have a second anchor? You know, what happens yeah. if you lose the first one? How many people have second anchors these days? And other question, because I this is one that I got wrong in our, in our sailing club lockdown quiz. Oh, the difference, crikey, here we go. difference between a jib and a genoa. And I I thought that a, that a jib just didn't overlap the main, but it, it's not that, is it? So what, what is the difference between a jib and a genoa? That's a good one. There is no difference. Oh, there isn't? No. I think fundamentally your, your, I don't know why you didn't get that correct, but my interpretation, a jib is a sail that goes to the mast and a genoa is a sail that overlaps the mast. So I would say that your interpretation was correct. However, anything that sets in front of the mast is, is, is technically, it's a head saw. So it can be a jib, a genoa, whatever you want to call it, but it is actually a head saw. Yeah. So, so when you've got a furling head sail, it's like it's a genoa when it's at its hundred and thirty percent, and when it's back when it's down to what was the lowest like? Well, you could probably get down the, to about eighty five percent. Eighty five percent. Small working jib type. So sail. then you call it a working jib. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even though it's well, a head sail, it's just yeah, yeah, out yeah. Right. That it's just um, legacy. Yeah. Um, um, set in the days. So what was the correct so I answer? Was right. well, yeah, what That's did they say? I can't they say? remember now. It's really long and complicated. I'm going to have a chat with Bill now. Sounds like this is so long. Yeah. They had so, too much time on their hands in lockdown yeah, to so come up with these questions. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the standard, the normal term. I can't think of what the correct phrase would be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if it's if it doesn't come past the mast then it's a jib and yeah. if it does come past the mast or the all the shrouds then it's a uh, genoa but yeah you can okay. call them anything <laughs> you want i mean then we get in the messy worlds of code sales uh. what is a standard sail wardrobe for a cruising yacht like maximus um in the bad old days because there are no good old days they're all bad because <laughs> modern technology has come along and made life so much easier um you would have had a mainsail obviously you'd have had a number one genoa a number two Genoa, a working jib, and then your storm jib. Okay? okay. Nowadays, you would have a mainsail, a furling Genoa, and then a cruising ship. Ah. And then the and then the bad old days come back to that. You would have a, a spinnaker. You would have had a spinnaker. The fundamental difference between a spinnaker and a cruising ship is that the spinnaker is a symmetric cell. So the, the two leeches are the same length, um, whereas a cruising chute is an asymmetric cell. So the leading edge, the luff, is longer than the trailing edge, which is the leech. And it can be any variety of sizes in between that, but that's the fundamental difference. So when you're setting it or flying downwind with the cruising chute, you don't necessarily need the spinnaker pole to set the cell efficiently. Um, Whereas with a spinnaker, uh, unless you want a multi-hole, you will actually need a spinnaker pole to get it to work. So you will need a spinnaker pole, you'll need a spinnaker guy, spinnaker hoist, spin spinnaker pole hoist, spinnaker pole downhaul, and the, and obviously the spinnaker halyard. Whereas with a cruising chute, spinnaker halyard and the two sheets and a tack line. It's relatively easy. Yeah. Much easier to set and sell. Is a cruising chute tethered by its tack? Yes. Yeah. Tethered. And when, when <clears throat> sort of how many years or decades ago did cruising shoots replace spinnakers then? I started making them in probably about 83, 84, because oh yeah. I'm that old. <laughs> <laughs> funny, but I would say that um, they really came into usage probably um, sort of late 80s, 90s. Gosh, isn't that yeah, funny? Yeah, they've been around for a long, long time. It's longer than I realised. I think I've just always yeah. sounded really old days. Yeah, no. So own. what was it? What were they called? MPS? MPS. Multipurpose yeah. Yeah. Multipurpose cell yeah. was an yeah. MPS. And and oh, there's so many various names for them. Yeah. The cruising shoes, asymmetrics, APCs, APRs, MPSs, MPGs, oh, <laughs> Jenica, 
a Jenica and a cruiser shoot, is there any difference? No, okay. it's just a different name. Um, <laughs> Flashers, what else are they called? So we're gonna design a cross-cut polyester mainsail and a radial cut polyester hybrid Vectran headsaw. What's unique about um, Bainbridge's Vectran cloth, um, which we developed five years ago, is that the Vectran is in both directions of the sail cloth. It's but in the warp and the fill slash weft of the cloth. So the Vectran fibers run along the cloth and they also run across the cloth. And this gives us a nice matrix grid of Vectran fibers, which um, reduce stretch and should add additional longevity and shape holding of the material. As the Vectran is in the warp, we can cut it in two directions, either cross cut or um, radial cut. Um, for this particular aspect, we've chosen a radial design for the head saw and a cross cut for the main saw. We're using six ounce for your main and six ounce for your head saw, okay. But I, I, I know, because I make the cloth, that the six ounce Vectran is, is, is really good in a radial construction. So to utilize the superior performance and the better um, characteristics of the cloth, we've chosen a radial cut for it, okay? Because it will make a better sale. Well, that, that, and that's all. And it looks sexy, you know? It looks great. <laughs> So we chose a radial construction for this because um, all spinnaker nylon is, is radially cut. Um, it performs so much better. It's designed as a radial cell. So that was over there. And I chose blue and white because PBO's colours seem to be blue and white. Um, I hope you're okay with that. That was the panel that, layout. Yeah, that looks um, really cool. So because it's asymmetric, okay, <clears throat> I chose an asymmetric colour scheme so that you always know which is the front of the cell and which is the back of the cell. I think that's a great idea, personally. Um, if you're having a cruising shoot made, which is an asymmetric cell, rather than having a symmetric color scheme, have an asymmetric color scheme so that you remember which is always the front of the cell and which is the back of the cell, because they don't work very well when you put them up back to front. And it does happen. So um, yeah, we'll use our MPEX 90 for that, which is um, uh, multi-purpose, um, Spinnaker nylon, so it's made out of 6.6 um, six nylon, which is a high tenacity nylon with good stretch and very, very good tear strengths. And it's one and a half ounce, which I said I wouldn't speak old language, which is 65 GSMs. Um, the thing about that is it will set in three, four, five knots of breeze, but you'll be able to set it in 10, 12, 15 knots of breeze. It won't tear the first time you hoist it, it it'll just, It'll tick all the boxes you need to tick. Yeah. You could choose a lighter weight, but to be honest, you're going to be short-handed or family cruising. The one and a half ounce to do everything you need it to do. 65 grams. <laughs> okay. You're sailing along. You're going to bear away and go down somewhere. Um, you're going to want to put the cruising chute up. So you would literally go up there, roll the headsail up, because then it gives you a nice open foredeck. Get your cruise sheet out of the bag, put the ropes on, pull it up, go backwards, pull the sheets on, and go save I mean, you know, save that. And then the other way around is you would probably deploy it in a snuffer, you know, a, a sock. So you would go up and um, you would just go to the mast, um, blow the tack, sail the flight forward, pull it down on the sock, put it down, pop it down, put it away in the bag, pull your genera up, turn around and go upwind again. Yeah. All right, really, really easy to set. And would you um would you need a pole as well if you no. were if you were dead down wind and you just wanted no. to out a bit more or so okay, so that No, you can do. I mean you, you can attach the tack, you can take it it's it's flown forward and, and above the pulpit. You can attach the tack to the pole, ease the tack line and, and bring the pole up and then the sail will have more projected area to weather and it will and it'll work very, very efficiently. Um if you want to do that, you can do that. If you don't want to do that, then don't do it. It's fine. Just ease the tack line a little bit. The sail will lift and project to weather anyway. Um, ease the sheet, sail downwind. Yeah. It's fine. Um, but if you do put it on the pole, put the tack on the pole, um, you'll, you'll, you'll be a little bit more stable and you'll 
you'll charge downwind a bit better. But it's yeah. not essential. It's a cruising shoe. It's 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 there to make life easy. And what's the range, the wind range for a cruising shoe? Oh, blimey! There you go. Um, the optimum range, I mean, most people design them around about 140 to 150 apparent. That's where they're optimised for because that's just a really nice, comfortable angle to go downwind in. Any, any, any lower that, and it's a bit wibbly wobbly. Anything higher than that, and it's a bit on your, bit on your ear. Yeah. It can be a bit hectic. Um, but like, like everything, it's, it's all about um, wind speed and sea state. Yeah. Um, if it's blowing 20 knots and you've got a, one meter twenty nasty solent chop. You don't put the cruising shoe up and sail it on a ninety degree reach. Well, sixty degree reach because you'll just break the sail, break the rig, break the sail, and it'd just be horrible. Um, but if it was, um, I don't know, nice flat water, five knots, and you wanted to have a nice little reach, you could easily reach at 75, 80 degrees with a cruising shoe. Purely because it's lighter breezes, you'll be able to set the sail, it's flat water, it'll be nice, it'll be really nice. And you'll be charged along and it'll be really real proper champagne sailing. As the wind strength increases or the sea state increases, you need to bear away. Yeah. What's the maximum? <clears throat> I was just thinking more of sort of the arc. I remember a lot of people do a pole down oh, yeah. Genoa. Absolutely. And a mainsail. They did I didn't see that many people sort of going for a cruising shoot. Is that because of the wind strengths? Is it over fifteen knots you'd say that yeah, I would, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, just err on the side of safety. I mean, the materials and stuff these days are capable of going more, but it's whether the people in the boats are, to yeah, be honest. Um, and, and I know the arc's a race. Um, however, it's, it's, you know, you're taking your home across it, <laughs> you know, and uh, you don't want to damage it en route. No. You know, so to take the easy option. Enjoy it. Enjoy the event. Yeah. You know. And right. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Twin running sales work good for that, okay. for sure. So, for the Maxi eighty four, the PBO boat Maximus, um, entry level is not really the right word. If you can find the right word, for sure. Um, but your initial choice, you should be starting at cross cut that crop. Um, you're going to get a sale that will do everything you want it to do, okay? Um, you're gonna get a sail that's gonna last a lifetime. And, and, and I mean it, sail cloth, woven polyester sail cloth is so tough these days. It will last 20 years. However, it's sail shape in 20 years time. If I looked at it, it would be appalling. You might say it's the best selling sail I've ever had, but it's not. Um, so, it's durable, it's relatively cheap, um, it's long lasting, it'll work and you'll be able to abuse it like you wouldn't be able to abuse any other type of material. The cons of cross cut Dacron, it's not, it's not the cut, okay, it's um, the choice of material and the fact that as it's a woven cloth, over time, the tightness of the weave will, will soften up, which means it will start to lose its um, shape holding facility. It, it'll be designed as a really nice optimum shape for that sail, for that boat. And as over a period of time, like everything, we all, we all go a bit south, we all get a little bit softer and we all get a little bit larger. And the same happens with sail cloth. The sail cloth will get, the sail will get fuller it will get deeper um, and it won't perform as well as it did when it was brand new. Yeah. But will it make the boat go forward? Yes. <laughs> will you be able to reef it? Yes. Yeah. Will you be able to hoist it? Yes. Can you use it in five knots? Yes. Can you use it in 20 knots? Yes. But it's yeah. 20 knot performance will be appalling. Okay, brilliant. That's okay. a great explanation. It's the shape holding ability yeah. of the woven material. Okay. So it's like Quite a pair of jeans, a well-worn pair of jeans. Yeah, exactly. Sagging right. in the bum. <laughs> the only other one is 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 um, yeah, in, um is is to maintain the weaven. It would be a hybrid woven, and then a cruising laminate, and then knobs, and then then fundamentally a diax laminate. So, but I think that's really it, and the diax laminate of the modern string sails. 
Okay. Okay. So. Which in a cruising environment would probably be tougher to, rather than. They would definitely be, yeah. yeah they'd, so they'd be tougher to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Streaming between just, as opposed to film. Yeah. Which is very work. much associated with race sales. You know, cruise laminates have been around for a long, long time. And the thing about cruising laminates is um, it's a scrim like a pre-prep when the way that you build a boat you have glass fiber and you laminate it up and you keep adding layers and laminate out and then you end up with a hull shape right? so similar with um, a cruising laminate is you have various scrims and these can be made up of different types of yarn okay and then you you kind of laminate them all together and then you wrap the two external laminates are made from a uh, woven polyester. So we go back to SPX, HSX, woven polyester, but significantly lighter than what you would make a sailcloth out of because what you're doing is you're encapsulating the other scrims and the films so that you can create a sailcloth. So it's built up of many layers of materials and films to, create, to get the correct properties, okay? And then it can, once again, it can either be cross cut or um, radial cut. The majority of it's radial cut because of the nature of the scrims and the way it's manufactured. Right. And those yarns can be polyester, aramid. Aramids are Kevlar or Toiron. Those are just um, like Hoover and vacuum cleaner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And you can use power aramids, which is a technora material. You can use um, carbon. You can use Dyneema slash Spectra slash UHMPE. Mouthful. And then you can use a combination of all those yarns to change the properties of the, the cruising laminate. And it can also be used as a racing laminate. So the bigger the boat, the more, the higher the loads, then the more exotic the materials you would use in the laminate so yeah and that's how it, that's basically how it works because yeah but laminates are heavy yeah okay and the downside to the laminate is is exactly what it is it's a laminate it's a series of um layers of material and scrim sandwiched together and glued under high pressure and heat and adhesive but it will let go at some stage so, whereas a woven cloth is, is woven, its inherent strengths are there, it will never let go. I mean, it loses its shape, but it's less likely to um, have a catastrophic failure. Yeah, so we, would you not get that 20 year lifespan out of You won't get 20 anyway. years out of people. Some, they'll go, oh, I've had more sales for 20 years, that's fine. You can say whatever you want. Um, traditionally, eight to 10 years from a cruise in laminate. Um, and that's good. Three to five is average, average, yeah. average good. But the thing about, you know, with the laminate is um, the shape that's designed, that performance in your sail will be consistent through the lifetime of the sailcloth. I mean, it will deteriorate, but only by like, like 15, 20% over a lifetime of a sail. Whereas um, a woven polyester, the lifetime of the sail is the lifetime of the sail, uh, depending on usage, wind strength, UV exposure. But you could have that same sail in 20 years time, but it wouldn't look like the sail it was when you got it brand new. Okay, it really wouldn't. It would have lost a lot of its uh, performance and shape. Yeah. But it would still be a sail and it would still work. Yeah. You know? So it's, it's, it's that trade off, performance over durability. Or durability over performance. What's 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 more important to you? That's interesting. You could also yeah, you could also, also look at the sort of lifetime cost of a sale as well, can't you? And absolutely. Um, interesting with that. I'm going to tell you one one thing about boats, which which I I not because I'm an old sail maker and not because I sell cloth as a living now. Sales are the best investment you can get on your boat, without doubt. Sounds are really expensive. They're not expensive for the lifetime and what you get out of a sale. If you spend five thousand pounds 
on your 35 foot set of sales. I mean, I don't know the current rate. I mean, just you talk to a sale maker and find out the figures. In 10, 15 years time, you'll still have those sales, right? You go out and spend, I don't know, 2000 pounds on the latest gizmo that goes bleep or Bluetooth, the second you get it out of box, it's out of date. Yeah? Or they'll upgrade the system and you need a new interpreter or a box. That'll never happen with your sales. They'll just, every time you pull them out, they'll make your boat go forward. Every time you get rid of them, your boat will stop. It'll just go on and on and on. They're a massively, really, really good thing to invest in on yourselves. So choose correctly at the right time. And, I guess and put the extra cash in if you can afford it. Go for the best you can. The sale cloth and sales, you get what you pay for, full stop. Yeah. I guess that goes also for buying a second hand boat as well. Is I don't know how how much stock people put into the sale wardrobe that it has. Yeah. Do you have any tips then for people looking at a second hand boat? And yeah, don't believe the owner. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if you, yeah, so if you're buying a second hand boat and you're unsure of um, of the existing sale wardrobe, go and talk to your local sale maker, take the sales up, explain what you're doing and ask them to give you an opinion on the sales. And sale makers fundamentally will, will, will be honest about it. Yeah, you'll have the old unscrupulous one, but the they're fundamentally honest because they want you to come back and use their services every year. They want you to do the regular care and maintenance of your sales, getting them laundered, cleaned, washed, serviced, the stitching checked over the batten box, all the stuff, the general wear and tear on the make. They want you to come back every year. Okay, so why should they, for a quick buck, tell you your sales, which are perfectly fine, are rotten and you need to buy new ones right now? Because they're just trying to make the money for you there and then. But you know, if they're honest and they do a job and you build a build a rapport up with your sale maker, you'll get great service from for the for you all of your sale sailing lifetime, you know. If you're sailing from the age of twenty to eighty and you're with that same sale maker and maybe his children and his grandchildren, keep that going and you will make benefits from it at the end of the day. Because okay. when it hits the fan you need some help, the <laughs> sale maker will help you out. But they're, they're okay. a, there's, there's hardly any of them that are in it for the quick buck. Yeah. Honestly, they're not. This is, this is, a, this is a long-term project. Buying sales, when I was sale making, you'd give them a quote, three, four, five, six months later, it might buy. Yeah, it's the only, the only people who, um, you got a quick reply to with the racing guys, because yeah. they need it next week to go. But, but for everybody else, the normal sale making, it's a big decision, choose the right cloth. Choose the right sale maker for you, and 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 away you go. So I do it. It's all about people. <laughs>